Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about maintaining resiliency and sustaining recovery. Joining us in our panel today are Pamela S. Hyde, Administrator, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. A. Thomas McClellan, Deputy Director, White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, Washington, D.C. Dr. Alexandra Loday, Addiction and Recovery Scientist, New York, New York. James Smallwood, Founder and CEO, The Choice is Yours Incorporated, Camden, New Jersey. Pam, how many people in the United States are in recovery? Well, the estimates are about 20 million people are in recovery, uh, working on being free of drugs and other and alcohol. And um, Alexander, what is recovery? What are some of the common paths to recovery? Well, that's really two different questions. What recovery is, according to people in recovery themselves, is usually, um, especially for people severely addicted, it is abstinence from drugs and alcohol, as well as significantly significant improvements in other aspects that constitute quality of life, such as employment, social relationships, mental health, physical health, housing, as well as access to leisure and, and activities that constitute a healthy and productive life. And Tom, why don't we give you the second half of that question then. What are some of the most common pathways to recovery? Um, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, I had the privilege of being with Alexandra, as a matter of fact, being part of a Betty Ford panel that, that looked at just that. Uh, question. And I think um, while AA 12-step is perhaps the most common, um, it was the agreement of the, that group that there is no single way to recovery, that in fact there are many ways. Um, expanding a little, um, that's important because at least in that setting it was agreed that you could be on, in recovery, uh, meeting the qualities that Alexandra just talked about, but also be on a maintenance medication. And so uh, I think many people don't realize uh, that. Some people can be sober, um, have good personal health, good social relationships, good citizenship, and be maintained on a, on, a, on a medication. It took a while to get there. though. I remember when the first concept of recovery came along, you know, it, we had to work at the concept of including Right. medication-assisted therapy uh, uh, individuals within that cohort of That's what right. was considered recovery. Um, uh, Pam, what are some of the principles uh, of recovery? Well, I think in order to talk about the principles, you have to know a little bit about addiction and why you're trying to get to recovery, because addiction does more than just um, make it hard for people to stop using drugs and alcohol. It disrupts their lives. Um, it disrupts their families, it disrupts their living situations, their, fa their friends. So I think some of the principles have to do with all of those things. There are many paths to recovery. So just as every human being is individual, their path to getting there is individual. Uh, there are, are principles about uh, getting your life back. And that's why what Alexandra said is so important, is that recovery has to do with all of those aspects of life. James, you've been there uh, along the path to recovery. You want to share with us uh, some of your experiences? Well, my experience has been that um, in, in, in the addiction itself, um, we're addicted to a drug, to a substance, and that the, the problem with, with that is that there's a problem within us that causes us to want to use the substance to hide from that, from, 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 um, to hide from the problem. And that um, my path was that um, there was a problem in me that I'd never took a look at. And so I chose to use crack or whatever it was or, or uh, other substances to, to, to medicate that until I came to the point to realize that I was sick and tired of being sick and tired of following that path of living that way, which had led me to homelessness and other things like that, that I says, well, you know, what can I do? And at that point, I had very little answers. Mm -hmm. But as, 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 as my word says, I just needed the faith of a mustard seed to realize that I couldn't do it if somebody else could do it. And so I, I, I walked many, many miles uh, to mm -hmm. a rehab center. 
What was that aha moment? You know, there usually comes a moment along the path of someone that has an addiction that finally, you know, an AA has said you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, mm -hmm. for example. Sure. But what was the moment where you basically said this is enough? You say this is enough when the crack no longer gets you high, when the heroin no longer has an effect, when the marijuana which is laced no longer has an effect, when these things no longer have an effect, you're just doing it now out of an addiction not really getting high anymore, but becoming more and more frustrated. And there comes the point where you just say, well, you have two choices left in life, to die or to live. I chose to live, and so I chose another path, not knowing what I was doing, but something different than what I was doing. I had no answers at all mm -hmm. to, the, to, to, to what the addiction thing was, but I knew that I was sick. Mm -hmm. Tom? Do you know, I'd like to add to what James said there. Um, a lot of people think that addiction is just a lot of drug use. It's not. What James just talked about is a change, a biological change in his body. He wasn't getting high anymore. His brain was adapted to the, to the drugs that we're using. That's so right. typical. And, and the other thing that he, he mentioned is there's something wrong with us. You, you, you have to understand that um, while substance use is really a function of availability and access, almost anybody will use, um, addiction itself is largely biological and genetic. You have a gene that gets expressed, and, and, that, and, and we don't know how, we don't know what goes on, but once that happens, you've got a disease, and it's a disease that, frankly, we don't have a cure for, but it's one that can be managed through recovery. And that is indeed the whole issue of dealing with it as a medical condition, and, and as such, how do we begin to heal the whole person, Pam? Well, I think the conversation we had a little bit earlier about medication-assisted treatment mm -hmm. goes along with this because the more we understand the biological nature of addiction and we're learning more and more through research about what chemicals happen in the brain and why this happens to some folks and not others, but it helps us understand the disease process of this. So whether it's a, a medication that assists, assists that process or whether it is a uh, mutual self-help approach, mm. or whether it is, frankly, some some people go through natural approaches. Right. Um, some people or use spontaneous. or spontaneous. Some people use traditional, non-traditional approaches like acupuncture, yoga, or meditation. And some people use all of those. And I think not only is the path to addiction pretty individualized, but the path to recovery is very much individualized as well. If I may add to what Pam just said. Um, Reco addiction is, uh, as has been said thus far, more than substance use. It's a biological disease, but it's also a, a condition that affects all aspects of functioning. And therefore, to get to your answer to your question about how to recover, to help the whole person recover, um, promoting and sustaining abstinence from drugs and alcohol is perhaps a first step for many, but it's not all there is. And these aspects, when you ask me how, what recovery is, and I mentioned other domains that constitute quality of life, recovery is giving people strategies and, and tools and resources to have a chance to improve those others' area of functioning. If you just get the person to stop using, but their housing doesn't improve, their physical, their mental health, their employment, their family functioning, they will go back out and relapse in all likelihood. So that's the, the whole person and every aspect of the person's functioning really has to be promoted and improved. And Tom, really, that is, that is the crux of it. I mean, there are some conditions that call for not only the person being treated for their addiction, but also for their mental illness. And in those yes. cases, the, the process is a little bit more complex and, 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 and it entails more inputs, correct? It, absolutely. But it's not different for these illnesses than it is for other illnesses. If you look up dual disorder, for example, in medical terms, you'll see hypertension and diabetes. So most people have multiple conditions, and it does make things uh, more difficult, uh, but not impossible. We have very good treatments. We have good ways of arresting symptoms. But as uh, Alexandra said, recovery is much more than simply not using drugs. And I, I really want to emphasize it be, for people who might be watching this and saying, oh, I don't know, I can't imagine giving up my drugs. The, you know, I think James probably is the expert at this table, but um, 
the, the untold secret is that recovery is a very attractive, happy way of life. That's what sustains it. It's that quality of life. Abstinence is a cardinal feature, but abstinence by itself is not going to do it. And like, if, like you said, James, go if, ahead. If I may add to that, that um, absence alone, you're correct, does not do it. That just like the attraction to using drugs was being around people who use drugs. Mm -hmm. That was part of it right there. And so once we choose to come out of the box and say, I don't want to use it anymore, but what do I do? Right. It's being now around those saying. people now in the 12-step programs who have stopped using. Mm -hmm. And seeing people with 25, 30 years who've been without drugs is the other attraction for me. Now, along with that, you also mentioned diseases that come along, the diabetes, the mm -hmm. hypertension, all the other things. That's part of it. So we are left with a scar of some sorts. But does that require to go back and use again? No, because we've been given the tools necessary to stay clean and sober right. and still have the diabetes, the, the hypertension, the other things that come along with it, the, uh, the arteries, or those, those things, the heart disease maybe, the leaking valve in the chest and all those kind of things, which are, 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 are the things which are produced from using drugs. When we come back, we will be talking about more on the vein of how to sustain individuals in recovery and also to look at some of the models that we currently have. We'll be right back. Sustaining recovery and maintaining resilience really has to do with creating structures in which people can uh, get help they need when uh, stressors happen, uh, when issues arise that make them um, think they need to go back to the drug and alcohol use that they may have engaged in before. Uh, this is not any different than any other disease. There are things that happen that make people with diabetes go back into the hospital or go back into treatment or go into a different kind of care. Same thing is true with substance abuse. Uh, there are stressors. There are um, often times when people will relapse. This is normal. Um, we, what we want to do is help people maintain ways not to relapse and have the kinds of structures and support the friends to call, uh, the non-drinking, non-using um, atmosphere to be in, the right kinds of places to live and be that they can get away from those stressors. Those are the kinds of things that will help that process. I don't think we should uh, think of relapses or slips as an indictment of the recovery, i.e. Uh, a person who's had a slip or a relapse shouldn't be viewed as having failed a recovery. What that person should recognize is that slips and relapses may occur. They're not inevitable, but they may occur. And if they occur, what the person needs to do is to engage in support and treatment if it's indicated so that they can pursue their recovery with new emotional or psychological vigor. People who suffer from drug or alcohol addiction sometimes say hurtful things. They drive the people who love them most away. If you know someone who suffers from drug or alcohol addiction, listen. Try to hear what they are really saying. Know that there is hope and help them find their voice again. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. People trapped by drug or alcohol addiction often feel like there's no hope, no way out. But for every lock, there's a key. And if you have a problem, it's good to know there are real solutions to help you get free. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I've been able to uh, pay back and help those who are trying to uh, seek recovery by my focus on my own recovery, focusing on how do I stay where I am in my recovery, 
focusing on not on the on the uh, on the drugs, the alcohol, and those kind of things, but facing focusing on the positive part of recovery, uh, such as staying in business as I am right now, such as maintaining relationships with my family, such as uh, being able to continue to pay my mortgage or my rent, or be able to have the things of life I didn't have when I was on the streets uh, in my addiction. Tom, I'm going to start with you. What are some of the economic benefits of getting people into recovery? Now, there's an untold story, if ever there was one. Uh, let's start with the economic uh, problems associated with addiction. And let's just start with some of the common drug-related occurrences. Uh, arrests. An arrest is about a $12,000 incident. Uh, incarceration is $25,000 to $45,000 a year for an incarceration. Um, separation of a child and a mother through uh, welfare separation due to uh, uh, substance use. Uh, I don't actually know what the number is, but it's a very big number. Now let's move to health. Uh, an emergency room visit is about $2,500 to $5,000. Uh, you know, chronic problems, as James was saying earlier, chronic problems caused by addiction, uh, you know, that's a, a huge amount. Uh, in healthcare alone, addiction uh, is expected to cost $100 billion, okay? So recovery is um, a tremendous economic investment. Now, Here's the other problem, though. We know a lot about the problems of addiction. We know a lot about the costs. We have not studied recovery near as much as, as we should. Alexandra is one of the few people here who has been really studying this. Um, we need a science of recovery mm -hmm. just as much as we need a science of addiction. Yvette, this is one of the biggest costs to businesses. And I think sometimes um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce or business leaders don't understand that, and we need to really help them understand that. Lost productivity, just as you've heard, people being concerned about their child or um, having to be in treatment, ending up in, in emergency rooms, whatever, it really goes to the cost of doing business, and that's something we really need to get the word out about. James, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to your experience, and I, I want to be able to... Uh, uh, frame it in a way that, as we're talking here, the focus of our show is, is on recovery. Yes. Obviously, you went through a program and you were out. Did you feel at that point that you didn't need any other support, that basically you had done your duty, you had gone to the various X number of units of care, and you were ready to, to rejoin society? How did that transition take place? And how, what types of, of, of components or elements did you find were necessary for you to sustain your recovery? Well, coming out of the streets, coming out of the actual use, going into a rehab, and coming out of rehab was only the beginning of the road to recovery. I like to say that the abstinence from the drug itself is one part, but dealing with the mental and the, and the, and the emotional effect that the drug had on you after recovery is another part. A lot of us today still deal with the, with the part of uh, whether it's paranoia, which might remain with us, which is the part of unsureness within ourselves, which might remain, even though we're not using. Those things might remain with us. So what helps us is the fact that we still have a support system, whether it's AA, NA, or whether it's other people like us who are still in recovery, which helps us to maintain that recovery that we desperately want so much. I realize that the problem I have right now is not a drug problem. But if I don't deal with the mental aspect of what's wrong with me, then I could go back to drugs. So I must steadily stay focused on the fact that uh, if I have the other paranoia, if I have the other schizophrenia, if I have other things which can remain with us after recovery, that I must take a look at those and deal with those on a daily basis. Um, we don't want to go back. I've been over 20-some years now in recovery, which I'm proud of, but I realize that there are some things today in my life would still go on, which resembles me back mm -hmm. to... But what did James do? In other words, you got out, and how did you... you obviously, right now, you have a, a wonderful model program that I want you to share with us sure. at, at some point. But tell us how you came out and you said, I'm going to remake my life, um, and what steps did you take in order to, to basically pull yourself out of the whole addiction process and into your recovery? Well, let's say this to you. When I came out and I went to my first meeting and I went to my second and third meeting, that I was still afraid to come out, outside. I lived in New Jersey. I was still afraid to cross that bridge back into Philadelphia. 
So I spent most of my first year at home doing all painting by the numbers and doing things like this to really talk to myself and regroup myself until I was able to come out. This was not done without the supervision of a sponsor who was very, very heavily in my life, who loved me enough to criticize me and let me know what I was doing wrong. Uh, but getting that point, I don't think it's nothing that James did all by himself. I think it was a group effort okay. by a lot of people who influenced me, who had already been where I was, who was 20, 30 years sober when I was only two years sober. So I lived, I trusted them enough, I loved them enough, and I wanted what they had enough to try to emulate them and try to take a look, how did you do it? I'm going to do it. And so today, I am here today, uh, proud, as I say, of, of not using drugs today, but there may be some symptoms okay. from the actual use which still may be present. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, well, uh, actually, Pam and I are now both in government jobs, and we come in contact with uh, congressional people. And what James just said is the single toughest thing for people who don't know this field to understand. They say, okay, James, you, were, you had drug problems. Let's just put you in jail. The drug problems will dissipate. You won't have a drug problem. What's the problem? It's done. And that's the difference between abstinence and recovery yes, right there. Yes. What James said, it's the gift that keeps on giving. You, you, you have these habits that, that are deeply ingrained. You're surrounded by stimuli that call you back to the old ways. And you've, especially if you've been in using drugs for a long time, you haven't developed social skills and, and, and good friends and uh, social supports to help you. So, so putting it in a very proactive in a very way, proactive individuals way. after treatment need to develop right. those a new connections, right, yeah. Pam? That's, that's right. Sometimes people need to deal with housing. They literally need to go live a different place. Right. Uh, in a different neighborhood. Maybe they ended up, as James did, homeless and had to start over with just finding a house. They need to find different friends. Uh, their whole life uh, before was based on friends that drank or took or used with them. Uh, they have to develop different inner strength. And that may for some people be spiritual. It may mm -hmm. for other people be meditation, other kinds of things. So it's like l literally, I think, rebuilding aspects of people's lives that sometimes we take for granted. And I do just want to build on something Tom said because I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. I hope people don't think this is heresy, but there's so many communities who want to build a detox center. Right. And I tell them over and over and over again, you are wasting your money mm -hmm. if all you're going to do is build a facility with all of its capital costs put in operating dollars so that you can bring someone in, detox them, and send them right back out there. So if we don't have something happening once somebody walks out of that facility, then we might as well not do the detox in the first place. This right. is why the Oxford House, you know, I was there at a, at a right. meeting of yes. theirs, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a marvelous concept. It really provides the housing. They are self-managing, yeah. and they get work, and then they pay the rent. Uh, Right, Alexandra? Yes. I think one of the two of the points that James made are that and one of your main contributions to the field, and there are hundreds of them, it was saying addictions are chronic relapse, the relapsing disorder. And so I always ask people when I make presentations about the science of recovery and the science of addiction that if you have diabetes, you don't graduate from diabetes treatment. Mm -hmm. People graduate from addiction treatment and I think even though society apparently is, is coming closer to buying the disease model as opposed to the moral failure uh, view of addiction, people still think, as you just said, uh, stop using, just say no, stop using, and everything falls back into place. And then people stop using, suddenly become with a clear head aware of all these other problems they have in housing, family, they're HIV positive and all that. And they have really no strategies to deal with it other than going back to substance use. Mm -hmm. So we need to do a, a better job at addressing these other areas of life which were affected by chronic addiction and that needs to need to be improved and have hope, yes. as you said, yes. models and hope that we can get better, that people can get better. I, want, I just want to tie it back to what Pam said. If addiction were just drug use, then a detox would be the perfect answer. It's quick. It's expensive, but it's quick. It's not. That's the reason we're talking about recovery. Recovery is a whole different thing. Uh, eliminating the symptoms of addiction is a good start, but it is not the end. It's not the end of the journey. And when we come back, we'll continue to talk about the journey. We'll be right back.
It's important to be familiar with the proper terminology surrounding addiction and recovery. One of the terms you'll want to be familiar with is peer-to-peer -peer recovery support. Peer-to-peer -peer services support recovery and are designed and delivered by peers, people who have shared the experiences of addiction and recovery. For more information on this and other recovery jargon, visit the Recovery Month website. Treat me. Treat me with understanding. Treat me. Treat me with courtesy. Drug and alcohol addiction is an equal opportunity disease. Individuals in recovery come from all walks of life and deserve to be treated with respect and admiration for winning one of the hardest battles there is. Treat me without judgment. Treat me with humanity. Alcohol and drug addiction deserves proper treatment. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. I'm a sophomore in college this year. Man, if you had known me when I was a sophomore in high school, nobody could tell me anything. I gave all my teachers a bad time. They all gave up on me, except my English teacher. Eight years teaching high school English, 10 years in recovery for alcohol addiction. To be or not to be? I got help. That's it right there. When you get help, who knows just who you'll help along the way. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Chase Partnership House was formed about 24 years ago, actually, when a guy by the name of William Chase froze to death on the streets of Rockville. Chase Partnership has a number of supports and, uh, that, and, and programs that we run here to help develop and sustain recovery. Um, we have relapse prevention groups. Um, we have co-occurring disorders groups. We have general counseling. Um, the staff are always available for the guys to talk to when they have issues or problems going on. Um, we have house meetings and life skills groups. Good afternoon, Chase Partnership House, Yolanda Moore speaking. We provide a lot of services. We assist them with all the things that's going to help transition them to independent living because we're transitional housing. And part of the things that people forget, they think is just, okay, they went from a shelter, they're trying to get their life together by staying sober, but staying sober is not just it. You know, they need to learn, a lot of the guys need to learn how to do applications. They, know, they need to learn how to do resumes. They need to know how to present themselves. When I moved over here, it was different. It was more therapeutic here. You know, you come in the door, you got to take your head off, you know. You know, more, everything was therapeutic. And really, and I sit back and I look at that now, that's what grounded me. Because I had to start it over, it's like a kid. We promote um, stabilizing long term. There's no way that 28 days is enough when some of these guys have been using and drinking for 30 or 40 years. Mind you, detoxing programs like that is a necessity. But they need to have some place else that they can fall back on um, to, to, to make that foundation strong. The benefit in being at Chase and the reason why we're successful is that we help that foundation get strong um, through uh, the peer on peer, through the meetings, through the, uh, um, the groups, through um, the interaction. We, we pretty much do everything together. Well, one thing that helps me maintain my recovery is working at Chase. Uh, it keeps me fresh. I see the guys, their struggles, and it reminds me of me many, many years ago. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer recovery service, I think, is really the only way that things can work um, for, for a person who doesn't have any knowledge uh, about what it's like to deal with day-to-day -day stresses without some type of drug or, or alcohol. Uh, when you have others that have experienced some of the challenges and have made it through without picking up, uh, you have a chance to talk to somebody about it before you make a decision one way or the other about how to handle the situation. Yeah, if you look back over and ask the guys, 
where you got most of your help, they will say somebody, maybe a counselor or a director, gave them an idea or pushed them in the direction. But when you ask them about, well, where did your real support come from? It comes from the network that they build in a program like this that helps them through this program and helps them and follows them out into the community. When I think back to when I first started, I felt there was no hope. But the key is, is there's other people out there that don't think that of you. And uh, I, I found that I had to lower my ego and accept help. All the people filtered through my life, and this is what I got out of it. I'm sober today. I'm happy today. I love people now. We all have different, as we say, doors that can be opened by different people. And hopefully somewhere along the line, somebody will open one of those doors or crack one of those doors just enough for that person to have a seed that maybe I can try something different. Maybe, just maybe, if this person can do it, just maybe I can. And if they just start that one step, we can work from there. Pam, let's talk a little bit. We've talked about the need for continuing support for individuals after treatment. Does a recovery-oriented system of care uh, present an opportunities for states to adopt measures that provide those supports? Absolutely. Um, literally looking at the things we've been talking about, about how people, um, uh, where they live, um, whether or not they are able to work, whether or not they're able to retain or maintain or get back their family and friend relationships. Those are all things we can, in fact, measure if you're looking at it from a systems point of view. And uh, we at SAMHSA actually are starting to really think about how would we measure these things in ways that we can make it uh, scientific and how can people like Alexandra put that together. And how difficult is it to measure, Alexandra? I'm not sure it's as difficult as people may fear once we have some form of an agreement, which I think as a profession we're getting to have an agreement of what recovery is, which is what you asked me earlier and what Tom spoke about as well. I think that uh, it's a question of recognizing that recovery is more than abstinence and then essentially identifying the areas which are critical not, so, not only to society and to treatment providers, but to people in recovery. Tom, I, I, I want to go back. In order to do all of that, the policies have to be there. How does ONDCP then assess uh, the need to focus on the aspects of recovery that are going to sustain people in their sobriety or through medication-assisted therapy? Um, well, first of all, I think it's been a, a shame that ONDCP and the federal government generally hasn't recognized recovery more uh, broadly and, and uh, fully, and we want to change that. We're opening an office of recovery to, to, to do a lot of the things that that were talked about, but government generally, I mean, if, from the ONDCP perspective, I think the first thing starts with saying what you want. What government wants is people to get into recovery. We don't just want people to be absent. We want them to have a full, rich re life in recovery. So that's a good start. That's not enough. Um, government needs to do more as the major purchaser of addiction services to start purchasing systems of care, not pieces. Many states, many cities will tell you, yeah, we have a recovery-oriented system of care. Um, this group over here does detox. That group over there does, um, you know, rehab. This group over here does long-term outpatient. But they haven't purchased a system. It's like saying, I have a car. The wheels are down in the basement. The uh, transmission's up there in the, in the uh, attic. I got a car. Well, the car doesn't run. And we need to start purchasing what we really see is valuable, and that's the recovery system, not just Is that just like the, the Connecticut pieces. model, for example? Connecticut is doing a very nice job. And then places and other around states. the country. I, I think some of the best uh, were, were you used to be in uh, New Mexico. They're doing a that's, lot of that way. That's correct. And these, these models really recognize the science that the components of a person's life don't exist in a, in, a, in a vacuum, nor do the components of a system exist in a vacuum. And recovery really, and frankly, prevention as well, mm -hmm. really has to do with multiple dimensions at the same time sustained over time. And so that's the kind of system of care approach. 
Very good. Uh, James, I want to go back to, for you to be able to tell us, you have done such a great uh, job of getting individuals that's uh, providing for individuals that second chance. Can you tell us about the business that you started and how it's helping individuals that are in recovery? Well, the business I started is a company I started that's called uh, The Choice is Yours, Incorporated. And that was developed from a conversation with my sponsor on the phone trying to find a name for a company. And he, his frustration with me grew so he said, I'm going to bed, James, The Choice is Yours. And so that, the company became about because of his frustration with me. Now, coming out of that is that the first class I ever did was like 25 single mothers with children who had an addiction problem, who had gotten mortgages on homes and went into the homes and for the first time, and one mother fell to the basement. There was no first floor in the home. So they were taken advantage of from the door, from that, from that door old. So now, in, in the 18th year of doing this here, I'm looking at people recovery every day. And I, I might screen 75, 80 people to get a good 20, 30 to come into my program because you have to meet certain criteria. I have an idea when you're ready to be trained, when you're ready to take on another aspect of your life. So in, in my program, we, uh, we bring you in and we tape test you and get you ready for if we believe that you're educable right now to go to another level in the construction fields of carpentry, plumbing, electric, those kind of things. And also, uh, we, we added a therapeutic process to my what we're doing now so we can recognize that there's a problem in the classroom. Uh, from my being experienced in this, I can recognize people right away if they're having a problem uh, dealing, if, they, if they're already on drugs in my classroom, if they have a problem concentrating, are they nodding out of my classroom? These things I can recognize and I can help them, not putting them out of my classroom, but um, recommending them to a rehab facility, recommend them, recommending them to another therapeutic uh, uh, approach so they can continue getting treatment. My whole idea is to, is to make these people whole, to empower them to be better, to be better than what they were before. Mm -hmm. And from there, we are seeing uh, 82 retention rate in my program as far as job placement and retention of jobs. Because of my case management, we have a two-year case management. When you leave my company, we follow you for two years after that. So if you fall down, you go back on drugs, go back on your child support, back in prison, we have enough people around us to pull you back out and get you ready to go back to work again. And Pam... It seems like that is an, an, an excellent example of what perhaps you may have experienced in, in New Mexico. How does SAMHSA now take those experiences and, and how do we provide the guidance for the states in order to continue to evolve in the field of, of addiction treatment? Well, there are technical ways that we do that in terms of the kind of materials we produce and the information we produce and frankly the data that require we require from the programs that we fund to make sure they're focusing on the right things but I think the other thing is the type of things that we are trying to fund and it's like the recovery oriented systems of care or the recovery communities uh, because we're trying to look at things like uh, when people are uh, first in recovery trying to do what things like what James talks about something as simple as transportation may yes. be one of the biggest issues or um, just how to fill out resumes or how to you know just some very basic stuff like that so we're trying to put the right kinds of dollars out we're trying to put uh, the right kinds of materials out we're trying to uh, make all of that available and then and then get the concept of recovery in part through the way that we collect data and say this is what we're trying to get to. We frankly also try to support people in recovery. Uh, I think you've heard and maybe we haven't said it explicitly but people the mutual support approach is as much as uh, anything is most important when people have other people around them who are going through this, who've experienced it, who've gotten through it and who can say hey James, hey Pam, hey Tom you know you're, you're screwing up, you need to shift if I may add to this, I think that the support is extremely important. You know, we, we have a lot of peer pressure when we start using drugs because we don't use drugs alone. We use it around a group of people who we admire, who we want to be like. And that process also becomes uh, uh, very, very important once we reach recovery. Can we still have the same peer pressure from those people who are in recovery? For those who have the 25, 20 years of, of recovery, who know how to recover from drugs and know how to deal with other aspects, not the drug now, the person themselves right now. I think we talked about earlier about the celebration is that um, we, we, we lose a lot of people back to the streets because of a celebrating one year or two years or three years of recovery of celebrating that with a party or something like that, that somebody brings in the, 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 the non-alcoholic beer maybe and think they're doing the right thing. Now they're back to where they were before. Mm -hmm. So there's an entire process here. And what we do in my program, we, we, we have mock interviews 
We have Maka. We, we talk about reading, writing, arithmetic. We talk about how do you fill out that resume. And we do it over and over again. How do you fill a job application out? How do you sit at the table at the interview? And how do you poise yourself to look at the interview and, and to be confident about this? So we bring all these things to the table before we release you from my program. As you say before, you know, our biggest problem has always been funding. How do you get the, fund? you get the funds to, to keep people um, doing what they want to do in my program? Because we get many calls per day saying, when is your next, when is your next program? Mm -hmm. With the people that I train, I can't charge them tuition. So I'm constantly looking for funding all the time to try to train these people to help them, to empower them to be better people. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about the resources that we need in order to have individuals sustain their recovery. We'll be right back. For more information on National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, events in your town, and how you can get involved, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Nice job. Hey man, how's it going? To a person recovering from substance use, what you say comes through loud and clear. Daddy! Daddy! I'm so glad you're home! If you know someone in recovery, give them support. And if you know someone who needs help, give them this number, 1-800-662-HELP. PROACT is a grassroots initiative that was founded about 12 years ago and it was founded really to um, put a face on recovery to reduce stigma, um, to also help individuals and families access and sustain long-term recovery. We can start with food, beverage, hospitality. I've done that in my past, sure. Okay, so we're... The services and supports that are available through PROACT are really quite varied and they're, they go from one-on-one -on -one kinds of services, recovery coaching, helping someone develop a recovery plan, which is very different than a treatment plan, um, to providing really the kind of support that is um, non-blaming, non-stigmatizing, to help people really feel comfortable accessing services. Well, I believe the most important support services that's, that we have here is peer-to-peer, -peer, where the new individuals that come in to the center feel more comfortable when they know that they're talking to someone who's been through the same things that they've been through. It's nice to know that somebody else has been through what you went through. Um, there's a little bit of comfort knowing that somebody can understand um, exactly the way I felt. The benefit of helping someone else um, cannot be overstated to the person giving the help and the person receiving the help you get a feeling as if you're in a partnership and the two of you are doing something together. You, you both grow from it uh, and you both become better for it and this, that feeling of hope can sit, continues to, to grow. I couldn't keep my mind straight. I'm thinking, well, I need, you know, I need a doctor. I don't know what I'm doing. But it was the whole coming off of substances and then learning how. We also have um, many uh, facilitated programs which are life skills and helping people really skill build kinds of services, not only get, gather information, but also to really try out some of the skills in a safe way to be able to help them really um, fill in some of the gaps that they may have either lost or never had as a result of their addiction. They have computer classes, they have meetings, um, stress meetings, um, self-esteem meetings, they also have a, a resources where you can find some place to stay if you don't have any place to stay. They have financial um, marketing skills where you can learn how to get your finances in order. Um, they have a lot just getting around in group discussions where you can um, meet new people and just gather information on to um, different places that you can go to help you stay clean another day. By putting a face on recovery, I love that saying, putting a face on recovery. Yeah. And just by putting a face on recovery, you, ne you never know who's in recovery. You know, your doctor could be in recovery, your pastor could be in recovery. You know, I always to act tell people, you know, when you was a little girl, a little boy, you grew up next door to Mr. Johnson, and then you call him Pop Pop for the next 20, 30 years, he's in recovery and you never knew it. 
I, I often share that for me, I've had many people, even while working here, say, I can't believe you ever use drugs or alcohol. And I laugh because, you know, I, I say I can provide you with a list of people who five years ago would, would say they couldn't believe that I'd ever be in recovery. So ProAct does a lot of work in breaking down a stigma to show that recovery is possible, that recovery happens. Even having a place like this in the community shows that there is a place where recovery happens rather than just a place where people can go buy drugs or alcohol. Not saying that therapy is not important. Not saying that recovery through uh, an outside entity is not important because truly they are, they are a basis. But when we come out of those places, um, when we try to establish our lives, there are barriers there, there are boundaries there. And sometimes we need the help to get past those boundaries. And PROEC has definitely been the help for me to get past some of those boundaries, yes. Pam, Recovery Month is sponsored by SAMHSA. It is. Do you feel that Recovery Month has been a component within the addiction treatment field that has contributed to the rallying of individuals in recovery? Absolutely, and in many, for many reasons. One is it's run, it may be sponsored by SAMHSA, but it's really run, administered, the ideas, the plans are a lot of volunteers. So a lot of people who are um, advocates, who are family members, who are people in recovery, who are parents, who are providers, really get together and work on this. And this is September every year, and this year it's going to be um, join the voices of recovery now more than ever. I think we have an opportunity, frankly, because at the federal level we have people like Tom and myself and others in clear places in the federal government that believe in recovery and want to support it. I had an opportunity to meet with those um, advocates and volunteers lately, and they're, they're jazzed and ready to go. The, the point of it is to try to help uh, America understand recovery, try to help people who are in recovery feel proud of that, try to help people who know somebody in recovery know how to be supportive, and frankly, try to get people to understand how they can advocate for the services and programs that recovery needs. And why is that important, Tom? Oh, I'll tell you, one of the major reasons it's important is that people don't know what recovery is. Mm -hmm. uh, in polls, you ask uh, normal people what it, what's recovery, they think it's somebody trying to become sober. Mm -hmm. And so it's terribly wrong. Um, uh, tragically, there's a lot of people, even in the field, who don't think mm -hmm. people get into recovery because as they, if they're in substance abuse treatment, all they see are people returning. So they don't see people living rich, full lives. And as Pam said beautifully, this is for America. Um, America needs to see success, and these people are successes by anybody's um, estimates. So um, uh, Gil Kurlikowski, the director of ONDCP, and I, and, and lots of people at ONDC were very, very proud to be uh, working with the uh, Faces and Voices of Recovery, which is one of the organizations, and with SAMHSA on, on doing everything we possibly can to support this. Mm -hmm. Alexandra, how important is that to have support for recovery as you're looking to f conduct further studies in that field? Well, it's critical because so far uh, there's been an enormous amount of, of federal investment which has contributed uh, landmark findings and, and really life-saving findings in many ways, scientifically speaking, in terms of the ideology of addiction, what is the cause? As Tom said, it's, it's a brain disease, it's a biological condition, and it's really started to contribute significantly to moving away from the stigma where people looked at addiction, alcoholism, drug dependence as a moral failing where the person was just bad and weak to something where the person has a condition which is perhaps chronic, but it is a condition that can be managed. So um, we have a science of addiction which has saved many lives. What we don't have is the science of recovery right now. There's so much we don't know. As Tom and Pam said, society doesn't really know that recovery is even a reality because not only for people in our field, as Tom said, some people in our field don't really know recovery is an option, but when you look at how addiction and recovery are portrayed, say, in the media, in the general media, mm -hmm. You see celebrities, and I'm sorry to say that, but most of the time you only hear of them when they relapse because it's a lot more sexy and dramatic than if they're just putting their lives back together. I mean, who wants to hear somebody's doing well? It, it's boring, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> it's boring for the public, but for the person like James and the other 20 million and probably more than that, 
whose lives have been touched and improved, and then their families, their community, their children, their loved ones, their employers, it's, it's critical. Therefore, uh, it's critical, I think, to the health of the nation and, and to this goal that Pam mentioned of really helping the nation understand and achieve recovery, that there'd be support at the federal level for supporting that science, because it has to be, and, and I think one of the beauty of having Tom in the current position is in, is that you believe in science, you believe that things should be empirically based, and we currently lack that empirical basis, so that support is critical. Getting back to the families, you know, I think that it's, it's so telling that you mentioned the families because, you know, um, my brother is uh, uh, bipolar with alcoholism, diabetes, high blood pressure. And, you know, it really, I think the nation needs to under, better understand recovery. And they also need to understand that addictions probably touch every single family yes. in this nation. And that, in essence, they need to be ready to, to be there to support, right, Pam? I mean, I think it's, it, it, it's not only to get them to understand recovery and addiction, et cetera, and the whole continuum, but really to get them to be supportive and not to give up. That's right. So many times families, by the time they're interested in learning about this, are already dealing with a family member who has disrupted the family, who they've had to separate from, who is turned up homeless and they're very worried about mm -hmm. them or any other way in which the family feels assaulted by that process. So it's really important for them to get hope. It's really important for them to understand that things can be better. It's important to understand that they can get some support mm -hmm. as family members. So all of these things are critical and frankly there is no better advocate than a convinced family member mm -hmm. uh, for treatment programs, for science, for all of the things, for, for, for people than family members. And what type of resources are out there, uh, Tom and Pam and Alexandra and James, for individuals who really do need to look uh, for support for, for their loved one who has just left treatment? I, I can answer that with two words, not enough. Mm -hmm. um, it's a terrible area of shortage partly because of the concept of, the, of this illness. It was weakness, it was or just a lot of drug use. What do you need family support for? Just get dried out. Well, it's not. As, as James poignantly said, uh, this recovery is a process. It takes a long time. And as Pam was, was suggesting, families can help. There are things they can do right and there are things they can do wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to develop many more supports for them, ways to bring them into the game of, of supporting recovery. And one of the things we haven't talked about, and I think we need to now, uh, is it's really not to give up on an individual when they relapse. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't give up on a diabetic when they no. have another episode or another issue they need to deal with. And, that's true of any chronic disease. Um, relapse is sort of normal. Uh, so I think the issue is how to use those relapses mm -hmm. to help the individual understand what happened, what were the triggers, <clears throat> what are the things they can do to develop uh, coping mechanisms to not have that happen again. I mean, there's lots of ways that are very positive about relapse in, in many ways. Talk to us a little bit about rec uh, the recovery community support programs, because in some states we do have a, a cadre of individuals who are in recovery who basically provide each other with these support networks mm -hmm. and, and which are very effective. Mm -hmm. and you know I think this is this came in some ways out of an, an AA model years ago where the assumption was that it was up to the individuals themselves and government really couldn't help this or or paid programming really couldn't help this and I think what we understand is that while that is absolutely critical that sometimes the people who are trying to help each other need a little support themselves. So it's uh, things I talked about earlier, some transportation assistance, just supporting each other and families, and just having opportunities to socialize in ways that um, are positive. So there's a whole lot about this program that allows a little more flexibility than we normally would put into a program which tends to like to, to fund counseling and detox and things of that nature. So this is more the life issues and supporting people who are in recovery who are trying to support each other. If I may add to that a little bit, um, you talked about the family aspect as far as helping the individual. You know, that, that, that works in two different segments there. I think that um, one of the problems we have with the recovery is a lot of times the family becomes the enabler mm -hmm. of the person who's trying to recover, which makes the recovery process a lot longer. 
And by the time he recovers, he is so severely damaged because a lot of times family think they can be the rehab, they can be the detox. And once, and then the family gets let down if the person relapses. And now they want nothing else to do with you again. So now we have to find a way because there's now, there's alanine, which is part of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's Narnine, which is part of Narcotics Anonymous. If the family could possibly position themselves to attend those meetings, they may become a much clearer person on the aspects of recovery. And that's why the family really has to learn how to best support yes. and how to yes. best help the individual who, who is in recovery. There are so many families who think they're being helpful by allowing their son to drink in the basement. Right. Uh, and, and, but they don't want to put him out on the street because they don't want to put him out on the street. And so having a, helping a family understand how to deal with that situation and not feel like it's rejecting their family member is really critical. One of the things that <clears throat> several of the points that were just made touched on indirectly is also that the stigma of addiction is not only directed to the individual who's affected by the drug and addiction, but it's directed to the family as well. So James said people think they can help by themselves. So the people don't go to treatment because it's like we must have done something wrong as a family. Our son or our daughter or my husband or somebody in my family has a drug problem. I failed, so I'm going to try to fix it now. And the reality of it is, unfortunately, bec and, I, and I really believe that if the message of recovery, which is really uh, disseminated by programs like this and Recovery Month and SAMHSA and ONDCP, if the reality of recovery in all of its glory and, and joy, really, joie de vivre, as we say in French, was as known by the American public as are the, uh, the ills of addiction, families who were affected by this problem would be more likely, I think, to realize my son or daughter has a problem. If it was diabetes or hypertension, they wouldn't be ashamed. And we have to make it such that we can get to that level, which will take some time, I think. And indeed, thank you for mentioning Recovery Month once again, because Recovery Month is celebrated every September, and we hope that all of our audience really gets engaged and really gets involved. It is a very worthwhile endeavor and we want you to be part of it. Thank you for being with us, great program. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of alcohol and drug use disorders and highlight the effectiveness of treatment. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning organizing and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to addiction treatment and recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP. It's important that everyone become involved because addiction is our nation's number one health problem and treatment is our best tool to address it.